Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ABB Process Automation Podcast. In our last episode, we looked at the small but mighty technologies that keep the world's toughest industrial environments running. Industries where extreme temperatures, hazardous chemicals, and high-pressure environments are the norm. From compact sensors monitoring temperature in chemical reactors to advanced instrumentation systems that minimize water loss in pipelines, these technologies are driving huge gains in safety, efficiency, and sustainability. But how do these instruments have such a big impact? How do they integrate into existing operations to make them more efficient? And how can they help industries operating in hazardous environments run leaner and cleaner? This is exactly what we'll be looking at in this episode as we ask the question, what are the small but high impact technologies that could help ensure in industrial plants run safely and efficiently. I'm Fran Scott, and this is the Process Automation Podcast from ABB. We are going to be joined by Chantal Kamat, R&D Corporate Executive Engineer in ABB Measurement and Analytics. But first, we are joined by Dr. Carlos Lopez Gomez, Head of Policy Links at IFM Engage at the University of Cambridge. What exactly is small tech in an industrial setting and what impact can it have when it comes to safety and efficiency? The first thing that comes to mind is the basics of industrial automation, the basics of digital technologies, things like sensors and actuators that really are the basis through which companies are able to make operations more efficient, to understand what's going on in the factories, and to make sure that we can control that environment. And what is the difference between a sensor and an actuator? Sensors are basically giving us information about the environment. So it gives us uh, the ability to understand what is happening in the factories and turn it into a signal. Let's say a digital signal. It detects, for example, whether a part is in front of us, whether the parts are moving. It allows, uh, sensors allow us to understand how fast things are moving. They also allow us to understand whether a person is entering the production site. This really gives us the eyes of the factories so that we can take uh, clever decisions. And the actuators are the mechanisms through which we try to influence the environment. So it could be uh, a moving part. It could mean uh, a press that you move. It could mean the way that you move a production line as well. So actuator is you influence the environment, the physical environment. That makes sense. So the sensors are like the eyes knowing where the dangers are and the actuators are like the hands making the stuff less dangerous. That's correct. Carlos, I believe you work on something called the Global Initiative for Industrial Safety, which is shortened to GIFUS. Could you tell us a little bit more about this, what it is and why it's so important? This Global Initiative for Industrial Safety, or GIFUS as we call it, uh, it is a partnership with the United Nations, the University of Cambridge, our institute, and the Lloyd's Register Foundation, which is a foundation that works uh, to promote industrial safety. And really the idea is that we came together as these organizations to see what we can do to tackle this massive industrial safety challenge that we have around the world. But we want to do it differently. We want to present safety not as a boring topic or as something that you know companies don't really want to think about. We want to put it as an exciting topic. And the way we do that is to focus on technology. So how how can we use these technologies that you mentioned, sensors, actuators, but all kind of systems, new technologies to make sure that we tackle industrial safety challenges, that we make our factories safer, that we reduce the number of accidents in our factories and that we save lives in this way. So we take industrial safety now as an engineering challenge and as a something that we shouldn't be competing against uh, when it comes to to different companies. We can collaborate and we can also share lessons both in the developed and developing countries. And what does that look like in practice? So we have talked to many organizations around the world, uh, private sector, 
public sector, international organizations, and we have defined a number of activities for the next few years. The first thing that we have done is to come together and develop a manifesto for global industrial safety. So this is, this is really a set of principles. So if you go up to this document, what it says is in very, uh, very simple steps, some principles that companies can start adapting to improve the way we think about safety and to improve the way we tackle safety in our everyday operations. So um, the idea there is to have those particular actions that the public, private sector, the regulators and the government can take in order to improve the sharing of safety lessons, the use of technologies, and just to get really safety at the heart of industrial decisions. Um, one of the things that really drives all of this is that the International Labor Organization has recognized safety af- as a fundamental global uh, human right. So before this, if, before two years ago, we only had four fundamental human rights, but because of this declaration of the ILO, the International Labor Organization, that means that now safety at the workplace becomes a fundamental human right. And that's really the principle number one of the manifesto. Carlos, I didn't realize that safety at work had that recently become a human right. Like, I'm so happy it has. That's exactly what it should be. Anyone that goes to work should be able to come home from work. And so this small tech can identify where this risk is, this potential risk, and also come up with a way to mitigate that risk. Yes, that's correct. So, you know, we have now the ability to use data from machines to better understand, for example, the issue of vibration. So when fact, when machines are vibrating in a in the wrong way, we can detect this now better. We have these chip sensors. We talk about the small heroes of sensors. We can use this chip sensors to monitor vibration, understand when the machines are going to break, and do preemptive uh, preemptive actions to avoid any accident. We can also use data from our um, all around our factories that are collected through sensors to understand uh, where we might see some collision happening. We can use computer uh, vis- uh, vision systems to understand where things are moving that shouldn't be moving. Carlos, I and I know you will have seen these sensors change within our lifetime. They've become smaller and cheaper and much more useful. But when we're looking forward, what are you most excited about these sensors doing over the next 10, 20 years? It is a very big question that everybody's asking. Why are companies not adopting more technologies? If they're becoming cheaper, more easily accessible, easier to use. Um, And there's many answers to that. What we have observed in practice is that... um, Sometimes companies are resistant to change. We have done this forever. Why do we need to change it? Uh, it's very common. We probably those companies that want to adopt these technologies, uh, they don't have the technical capability to do it. They don't have the technical know-how. Um, so they don't have the finance to do something different. But also it's something related to uh, in very... Uh, regulated sectors, you don't want to change your process because that requires a new certification, new client re- approvals, etc. So there's a number of issues about why companies are not adopting. But in the next five to 10 years, uh, we expect more technologies to be used. I think there's a lot of potential, especially with the most simple and cheaper technologies. Uh, we here, here at the Institute for Manufacturing have a program for low cost technologies for small and medium enterprises just to make sure that companies don't think this is a massive investment. You don't need to change all your machines, but actually we can bring some of the new to the old machines and, and upgrade these, these, your operations. Uh, so yeah, in, in the next 10 years, we will expect to see, uh, more technologies being used, small tech. But also, just going back to the, the topic of safety, more a better understanding of safety as an issue that has to be central to technology decisions, as a fundamental human right, 
and as an exciting technological challenge that we can all work together to tackle. Thank you so much, Carlos. Up next, we have Shantala Kamat, R&D Corporate Executive Engineer in ABB Measurement and Analytics. And I started by asking her for some examples of small tech that have changed the game for industrial plants. I'll give you today two recent examples of small technologies with big impact. Consider ABB's award-winning non-invasive temperature measurement instrument, the NINVA. So NINVA can measure process temperature directly from the surface of the pipe without drilling into it. And this is quite unlike the standard temperature measurement methods that rely on thermowells. So adding temperature measurement point to your process has never been simpler. Additionally, it's, it's a perfect solution for demanding safety applications in oil and gas and chemical plants. And I suppose a thermal reading on an instrument could let you know if it's running efficiently or not, because sometimes excess heat can be generated when things aren't quite running as they should. Yes. So temperature is one of the most important measurements in process industries. It could be for monitoring, as you said. Now it's also used not only in monitoring, but also in process control. So you have to take actions through your controller when temperature raises, lowers, its trends are not as expected. So temperature measurement points are the most frequently used measurement points in industries. That's one example of small tech, but there is another one, and this has a big impact, and this is called the Ethernet Advanced Physical Layer. So when we hear about Ethernet, we are usually reminded of that Ethernet cable that we use in homes and offices. Actually, Ethernet is the most dominant connectivity technology in the whole world. But until recently, Ethernet connectivity was not possible in the harshest industrial areas. Why? It's because these cables did not support intrinsic safety. It did not support long cable lengths. And they were not strengthened for um, electrical noise that you experience in industries. Now, this is solved with APL. ABB contributed to developing this open standard in a collaborative industry effort. Now, the last leg of the industrial connectivity, that is, the connection to the instruments and actuators, can be achieved through Ethernet. And it brings 10 megabits per second high-speed communication up to a 1,000 meter of cable length, and it's intrinsically safe, which means it can be used in the most hazardous areas of industries. So they integrate seamlessly into automation systems. They provide rich data access and they enable real-time monitoring and data-driven decisions. And so the impact of that very physically small bit of technology is huge, right? Absolutely. So how does access to measurement and analytics help operators to make a safer and faster decisions? Have you seen this in action within your work? So better decisions are really a result of accessible data and operator experience. So abundant data is available from the instruments. See, today's instruments are much more intelligent. They're not only measuring the main um, uh, process measurement, but they're generating other data that can also help with maintenance and diagnostics. Added to that, we have reliable high-speed access to this data even from the hazardous zones, with, which is made possible with technologies such as Ethernet APL. So operators can continuously and remotely monitor the conditions. This helps them act on even minor anomalies before they turn into major incidents. Similarly, when you have a combination of high-resolution data and advanced diagnostics, it enables predictive maintenance strategies. You can do early fault detection and clear prioritization of what are you going to intervene first. And I want to give you an example. You know, an example of timely data-driven decision 
comes from continuous monitoring of gases and pollutants on offshore platforms. So this ensures rapid detection, instantaneous detection of emission anomalies. And the end result with that information is operations are more sustainable and they can be kept compliant. It's wild to think that before these devices, we just weren't measuring these types of things with the type of continuous measurement that we're doing because it makes so much sense that they need to be measured in order for us to make things run in the most efficient and environmentally friendly ways. Yes. So looking to the future and how this technology is going to develop, how do you see AI and predictive analytics further improving safety and efficiency in these harsh environments? And that's such an important question in these days. In our industry, we see that AI and predictive analytics are already transforming our approach to industrial safety and efficiency, especially in maintenance and diagnostics. Let me take a recent example. ABB launched an AI-based solution called My Measurement Assistant Plus. So this is a tool to simplify device maintenance. It uses generative AI to interpret complex uh, technical data, and it provides step-by-step -step maintenance instruction. It increases efficiency, it reduces human error, and also reduces training time. And that's what we do now already. But looking ahead, this technology will increasingly help us from being more reactive to proactive operations. So if you imagine combining generative AI with predictive models, you'll have clients that can learn from their own data, they can adapt in real time and prevent failures even before they occur. This means fewer people are exposed to dangerous conditions. It's a major shift and in how we protect our people, processes, uh, and the environment. And so finally, Shantala, what excites you most about the next generation of small tech? And how do you think it will transform your role as an engineer in the next five to 10 years? Thanks for asking, Fan. Because there are so many small technologies and exciting things happening in the world, what's thrilling me the most is the acceleration of industrial connectivity. So it's, it's a different thing to have small tech isolated, but together they're more powerful when you connect them. So I'm thrilled with industrial connectivity and we are slowly witnessing a shift to fully integrated ecosystems of interoperable devices See, they'll become, the, the small tech that we talk about will become part of the brain of the plant and not just its senses. And of course, sensing is very important. So that's another area that excites me. We are already seeing a lot of advancements in sensing, such as the NINVA, the non-invasive temperature that I spoke about. So combination of all these small technological improvements um, will shape and transform the future of process automation. Thank you so much, Shantala. And that is all we've got time for. Of course, thank you to our guests, Shantala and Carlos. I'm Fran Scott, and the Process Automation Podcast is a fresh air production for ABB. Follow now for free wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode.